Okay, now that you know just a little bit about how the fork join framework is designed to fork and join, uh, and to divide and conquer big problems into small problems that run in parallel and then get joined back together again, let's talk a little bit more about how it's actually structured internally. So we'll talk about some of the key APIs. We'll talk about this thing called the fork join pool, which is the main client-facing API. And then I'll also talk about this hierarchy of fork join tasks that are used to actually program the fork join pool. So the class fork join pool is a public-facing Java class that implements something called the executor service interface. If you take a look here, you can see that fork join pool implements the executor service interface. Now, under the hood, it actually does a few other things, but we'll talk about that in a second. So this interface, the executor service interface, is the basis for all the different subclasses in the Java executor framework. So we have the Java executor framework, which has a whole bunch of classes in it. And the executor service is kind of the key interface for that. There's also another interface called the executor, but it's very, very simple. It has a single method called execute. So the executor service is actually the interesting one. <coughs> and it defines the methods we're going to be talking about, at least partially. Um, there's also this thing called the abstract executor service, which implements this and provides a bunch of helper methods that are used by other classes. <coughs> Other implementations of executor service are used to execute runnables and callables. We had talked briefly about runnables and callables the other day when I was describing how the, the uh, functional interfaces were defined. Remember, a functional interface has a single abstract method. So runnable, callable, those are examples of functional interfaces with a single method in them, run or call. The fork join pool, in contrast, is used to execute something called fork join tasks. And it's possible to also implement runnables and callables to, to run them with a fork join pool, but it's kind of pointless. You probably don't want to do that. You'd probably want to use thread pool executor or something else to run those things. So what's a fork join task? Well, a fork join task is a class that's executed by the fork join pool. And it associates a chunk of data often a subset of a much bigger chunk of data, with some computation or computations to perform on that data. And the point behind this is to enable what's called fine-grained parallelism. So you have, at least in theory, very, very, um, you can have lots and lots and lots of fork join tasks. <clears throat> the reason why you can do that is that a fork join task is very lightweight. So unlike a classic Java thread, which we talked about very briefly the other day, where we spawn threads. Threads have their own runtime stack or stacks. They have program counters and all kinds of other stuff. They're typically associated with something that runs in the operating system kernel and so on. <coughs> in contrast, a fork join task is much lighter weight. And as a result, you can have thousands or tens of thousands of fork join tasks and they're run on top of a very small number of worker threads. So a worker thread is actually a regular old Java thread. And you can have a small number of those, typically roughly about as many worker threads as there are cores on the virtual machine, give or take. And on top of that, you can have a gazillion fork join tasks running around. And again, each worker thread has all the trappings of a regular thread, because it, it is a regular thread. So it's got a runtime stack for Java code. It might have runtime stack for native code. It has program counters, registers, thread-specific memory, blah, 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 all kinds of stuff. You can read about what's in a Java thread here. And so the pool of worker threads <coughs> are just Java threads. There are two key methods in a fork join task. Not surprisingly, they're called fork and join. And these methods are used to control parallel processing and then merging of stuff back together. So we're going to take a look at this and kind of talk through the things. So fork, that's one of the methods, is used to arrange 
asynchronous execution of the given task in the appropriate fork join pool. So you can kind of think of fork as sort of like a lightweight version of thread.start. Thread.start does a bunch of stuff. Uh, fork does less stuff. Um, Thread.start actually allocates a runtime stack and all this other good stuff. Fork just basically queues up the subtask onto a queue. We'll talk about that in a second. So when you fork something, you have a task, and it's the parent, and you can fork. Let's say we fork twice. <coughs> and then we have children fork join tasks that are going to be running in parallel on the cores. So fork doesn't actually start running the task immediately, but instead it, it places it onto a work queue. So it sticks the item onto the end of a queue. Or actually, not at the end of the queue, onto the front of a queue. We'll talk more about that later. Um, and then join is the thing that the parent can use to get the results that it forked. So it'll return the result of a computation when it's done. So unlike thread join, which blocks waiting for the thread that it's waiting on to finish, fork join task join doesn't actually block the calling thread. What happens instead is it uses its worker thread to run tasks, which is kind of a, a funky, weird thing. But the whole goal here is to try to keep computation humming along as efficiently and maximally utilizing resources, cores, as possible. And I like to call this the collaborative Jiffy Lube model of processing. So for those of you who have never used Jiffy Lube, this is a picture of a Jiffy Lube station. And in Jiffy Lube, you've got a bunch of bays. And it's for oil changes and checking your tire pressure and the fluids in your car and replacing windshield wipers or you know, air filters or whatever. You know, Lots of things that they could do in that this service, this brief Jiffy service station. And what they'll typically do is they'll have you know, three or four bays. This, this example shows four. And cars pull in, and there's typically a group of you know, maybe two workers per bay. And they go ahead and process each car that pulls in. So the way to think about the uh, fork join pool is to think about each of these bays as kind of like a worker thread or worker threads. And <clears throat> In the cooperative Jiffy Lube model, if some of the bays don't have anything to do, like in other words, they have their work crew, but there's no car in there, then when a car pulls in, then free workers, free service personnel, could come over and help to do the servicing of a particular car. So again, if you have, let's make it easy. Let's say that there's one worker per bay, kind of like the fork joint pull model. Um, but at any given time, there's only, you know, say, two cars in, and the other two cars aren't there. So in that case, the people who would otherwise just be sitting around idle waiting for work to do can head on over to the place where there's work, and they could do the servicing on the cars. So that's the cooperative model. And that's the way the fork join pool works, and that's the way that join is processed. So when join is encountered, it basically just says, hey, Thread, go ahead and do some processing on my behalf. And when a worker thread, remember this is the Java worker thread, encounters a join, it processes other tasks until it notices that the subtask that the join was called on is done, in which case then it can return. So that's very much like the Jiffy Lube model. And I'll, I'll use that metaphor a couple different places just to remind you that if there's nothing else to do, threads can go off and do other processing on behalf of others who would otherwise not get any work done at that time. Yes? So the, the worker thread, as we'll see when we get into the implementation details here shortly, the worker thread's purpose in life is to just stay as busy as possible. They want to stay busy. They want to stay busy. And so if they encounter a join which says, you know, don't continue until I get my result. I'm a subtask. Don't continue until I'm finished. Then in that particular case, rather than just waiting idly, instead the worker thread will go, all right, keep, I'll, keep an eye on, I'll keep an eye for the results for this particular subtask. But in the meantime, I'll go off and process a lot of other stuff because I'm trying to make 
I'm trying to maximize my workload. And when I'm finished with those other things, if at some point along the way I happen to notice that the join for this subtask I'm nominally waiting for is finished, then I'll go ahead and return. So it's, it's basically a way to let the worker thread keep as busy as possible. And you see that's one of the big themes in the fork join pool. So uh, please, no laptops in class. Yeah. A chance for infinite loop. What, what do you mean? Uh, well, certainly if, a, if you fork something and it goes into an infinite loop, then it will infinitely loop. Um, that could cause a problem, yes. So the best idea is don't write infinite loops in your code. I mean, that's, that's always a problem in any program. If your program goes through an infinite loop, it doesn't matter whether there's one thread or many, then it'll block or do something weird. Programs don't actually use fork join tasks directly. Instead, what they do is they extend a subclass of fork join task and override the compute method of the subtask. And we'll see that there's three classes here, two of which we're actually going to look at in more detail. So one of them is called recursive action. And that has a compute method that returns no results. There's also recursive task. And that is used for computations that return a result. And then there's also something called a com counted completer. And that's going to be used for computations in which completed actions trigger other actions. So this is used primarily for things like Java parallel streams. We're not going to talk a lot more about that. But recursive tasks and recursive actions are important if for no other reason that your next programming assignment will have you programming that stuff. Interestingly enough, and this is actually sort of frustrating, if you recall, I, I think I mentioned the first or second day of class that the history of Java was that the fork join pool came in Java 7 before the cool functional programming features came along in Java 8. So as a result, these classes, recursive action, recursive task, kind of completer and so on, are actually not functional interfaces. Even though they really only have one abstract method, compute, they're not functional interfaces for other reasons. And for that reason, you can't use lambda expressions to implement these things. So you have to do a bit more <clears throat> traditional Java, where you extend stuff and provide the syntax and override the methods and so on and so forth. So it's a little bit more verbose than we would have liked. Of course, all is not lost because the Java Parallel Streams framework gives you a super duper powerful functional API that encapsulates the fork join framework. It just does it at a much higher level of abstraction. But sadly, you cannot use, cannot easily use lambda expressions with the fork join framework directly. You have to either build a little wrapper or just suck it up and use classic Java 7 and earlier forms of extension rather than lambda expressions or method references which is a shame. One of the other things you can do with fork join pool is you can have clients that are not fork join tasks. In other words, just any old piece of code. Submit fork join tasks for processing. And there's a bunch of methods, execute, invoke, and submit. And we will talk about these methods later when we get to the next part of the lesson. Right now, I just want to talk about what happens when you submit these fork join tasks from a non-fork join task client. So let's say we're just any old piece of code. We're not something that implements fork join tasks. We're just some other piece of Java code. And we want to give some work to the fork join pool to run. And what you do is you submit or invoke or execute. Those methods do different things. But for now, we'll just look at submit. You submit your fork join task to a shared queue. And this shared queue is then accessed by threads in the fork join pool. And what they do is they pull off fork join tasks from the shared queue, and then they push them onto what's called a work stealing queue. And we'll see later why it's called a work stealing queue. The, the reason is pretty obvious, because it steals work. And uh, that's the way this all works. It's pretty cool. So you submit things to a shared queue. The work that's pushed here are fork join tasks. They are pulled off the queue, and then pushed onto the work stealing queue. As you'll see later, it's a push and pop model for normal processing. And we'll talk about why that is in a second. 
And then there's also a stealing model that's used to steal the work. And you'll see why that's done that way too. We'll talk about the details of uh, work stealing in a minute. But for right now, the key thing to remember about this is the goal is to maximize processor core utilization. So that's kind of what we were just talking about a second ago uh, with Venus question. So the whole point of this is to be able to keep the cores busy. And if a core has nothing to do, rather than just sitting there idly, it will steal work from another uh, thread, from another, uh, from another thread's queue. There are intentionally very few knobs that can be used to control the way in which a fork join pool works. So it's a very simple interface you can invoke, you can execute, you can submit, and so on. You can shut things down, you can check to see if you've been shut down. So in some sense, a fork join pool is a little bit like a one-button mouse, if anybody ever has worked with a one-button mouse. You're really, really simple, at least in theory. Conversely, there's another framework, which we're not going to talk much about in this class, but is also part of the Java executor framework called the thread pool executor. And the thread pool executor has a gazillion different settings and options that you can control. So it's like a many button mouse. I don't think I've ever seen a mouse with this many buttons, but they do exist. And if you really want to go crazy with buttons on mouses, on mice, then that would be the mouse for you. So some of the things you can do with the thread pool executor, you can change the max size of the pool, you can change the default size of the pool, you can have a work queue, you can keep the threads alive for a certain amount of time, you can have factories that make the threads, you can have special policies that are set if you get work and you can't handle it at the moment, you can have reject handlers and so on and so forth. So there's lots and lots and lots of stuff <clears throat> that you can do with a thread pool executor. In contrast, the fork join pool is meant to be really, really simple and it does most of the stuff for you, so you don't have to worry about the details. There are a few things you can do with a fork join pool, however. You can configure its size. And there's two ways to do that. You can either set the size of the common fork join pool in the entire process. So you can say, I want 10 threads in the common fork join pool. Or you can use this thing called a managed blocker. Uh, we'll come back much later, probably either Wednesday or next Monday and talk more about how to set these pools. And you'll have to know how to do that for some of the things we're doing in the class. All right, so that's the end of the second part of this discussion. <clears throat>